fifth video, we look at a critical topic for the biopharmaceutical industry, is the ethical implication of those technology. We really want to maximize the use of technology for patients, uh, for healthcare ecosystem, healthcare provider, healthcare professional, and, and the general you know, healthcare environment we operate into. Uh, but as an industry, we have to be really conscious about all the ethical and risk implication of those technology. And so that's important for us to you know, step back a little bit, understand how we can self-regulate and actually launch you know, those technology to make sure the patients feel secure. And that's what we're doing as we speak. So let's you know, give you a bit of a perspective on how that works. If you remember in earlier videos, we talked about exponentiality of technology, and that's what you'll see on this graph uh, with the blue curve. So the blue curve indicates the exponential progress of technology that we have around us. And then the green curve is actually the, um, let's say, the legislation uh, and, and the regulatory frameworks that are around us. So the regulatory framework and, 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 and you know, the, the environment around us is functioning in a linear manner and regulating technology in a linear manner when the, exponen the exponential in technology is creating a huge gap in the middle. This is what I call kind of the gray is the new black. We used to operate on the left side of, of the curve uh, where we had mostly the technology and the, and the regulatory uh, curve that were very close to each other. So we operated in an environment that had a lot of black and a lot of what. What can, can't we do and what can we do? And a little bit of gray. So we had to navigate a little bit of gray, but things were roughly written in stone. And then from time to time, we'll have regulatory readjustments and then we'll readapt the programs around us uh, and the frameworks we operate into. Now, with this you know, divergence between the exponential technology and the linear regulation, what we're starting to see is a huge gray area in the middle with a lot of different shades. Um, so we operate a little bit of black, a little bit of white, and a lot of gray. So our ability to navigate this as an industry is going to be critical. So that when we develop those digital health solutions, genetics programs, uh, or you know, biotechnology solution that on medical device options that we're actually really thinking about ethics by design and also properly self-regulating as an industry so we can really maximize the potential of those technology while reassuring our stakeholders. I'll give you a few of, of the ethical challenges associated with, with those technology. Let's start with gene editing. We mentioned gene editing before. Uh, you know, everybody thinks designer baby is the future. If you read this MIT technology review, it will take you actually, it's not the future, it is the present. And you can see on the right side a, a real example of a family which is attending a fertility clinic. And what they've done is, you know, they've, they've given, you know, eggs and, and sperm, and then the clinic has produced a large number of embryos, about 200 embryos. And then uh, they're offering to the family, anonymized of course, embryo 78 is a, uh, let's say, a male, uh, which has a higher than likely uh, you know, capabilities to achieve a SAT test, uh, which might have a slight uh, you know, uh, risk of boldness, uh, maybe a risk of uh, you know, diabetes, but maybe also a lower risk of cancer, just as a, as a random example. Uh, and then the next one is going to be embryo 85. It's a little female, and she's going to be uh, with this size, this type of eye color, this type of potential disease, or this type of also opportunities. They'll have to choose between those options. Uh, and that's already a form of natural selection. Uh, now, do we like it or not? There are ethical challenges attached to doing this. Now, some clinics are moving further. Not only they just want to uh, you know, let nat nature produce those 200 embryo, uh, they want to make the selection. They want actually to modify the genes so that we don't have to choose between you know, being bold and having cancer or diabetes and a heart attack. We don't want any of that. We can choose size. We can choose strengths, we can choose intellectual capability, we can choose no disease or very few. Uh, and, you know, and that's where you know, it's going to happen with the form of eugenism, uh, which is a selection through genetic tools. Um, and that leads to a really a lot of challenges, um, <clears throat> especially in the field where if you do research on non-somatic cells and non-embryo, that, you know, leaving us great opportunity. Uh, but there is an, an, an emerging field around stem cells, somatic cells, and embryo, which is creating some challenge because when you make genetic modification um, to those somatic cells, for example, in embryos, uh, they will actually perpetrate themselves through reproduction naturally. And that's creating an, an issue that you actually embed those genetic modification in the human genome. Uh, <clears throat> so we'll have to really think about 
how do we do this in partnership with our, you know, our stakeholders, with WHO and with many other organizations across the world. Um, the, the biopharmaceutical industry is actually working at self-regulating those areas um, so that we can really leverage and maximize the power of gene sequencing, gene editing, and all those ge next generation technology, which let's be honest, can save our life, can reduce or eliminate disease. So we must use them, it's just we must use them in an ethical way. Another area around responsible innovation is, I'll just pick a few of you know, what has happened the last couple of years around the field of health innovation and their ethical implication. Uh, this one, which I, you know, I, I found interesting, was an expert in euthanasia actually unveiled a suicide machine at an Amsterdam fair quite recently. What he was doing is leveraging what we talked about, digital modeling and virtual reality, to model a machine and then offered the, the, the plan to be you know, free of charge uh, you know, on, the, on the internet or with a modest fee. You can download the digital plan for this suicide machine and you can 3D print it. So you can actually do your suicide machine at home and for a very little cost. Imagine the ethical implication. We've not fully you know, defined how we're you know, thinking about it around euthanasia. There's a lot of you know, dilemma in a number of countries around the world um, and that still is, is an area where we need to make some progress. Um, in, uh, in California, a couple months ago, a, um, a patient uh, you know, which was about to die within the next 48 hours was told by a robot, which was actually a mobile bot with a screen. Uh, the screen was representing the face of a doctor that was in a remote location. But technically they felt like with the family that the bot announced to the patient that he would be dying within the next 48 yeah, hours. Which sparked an outrage with the family that says, hold on, it's you know, inhumane that a robot is announcing us that we're going to die. And you know, it sparks also some, you know, some, some questions. It might be a good option, you know, especially when you don't have any you know, a healthcare professional available to do that. Maybe bots can actually do it in a way that is even more humane. They, you know, they show compassion, they're not tired, they're not stressed about announcing the bad news. Or maybe we think it's not something that we should be doing. So we need to think about those ethical implications. For the first time um, in, in, in China and I think recently in Japan, a robot passed a medical exam and that was a wow moment. So they had a number of doctors passing medical exam and they, what they did is submitted you know, an algorithm that they pr previously trained on the, on the different medical expertise to pass the exam and surprise, the algorithm passed the, the exam. So technically they had this whole oh shit moment, pardon my French, where they were like, he's a doctor. So the algorithm was technically a doctor, of course. They didn't grant the license, but it's really baking the questions on how far those algorithms can actually go, how much they can help us, but also are they allowed to practice medicine and what are the implications around for our different stakeholders. Terrorists, you know, that's one of the negative views of those technology. You could actually think about what happened in France, uh, you know, a few years ago, where a terrorist, you know, drove into a truck and killed hundreds of people, you know, on, on the 14th of July, the national French holiday um, in, in, the, in the Côte d'Azur and actually killed many people. Uh, he was actually sitting on, on the driver's seat. What about we actually somehow hack into a, a, an autonomous vehicle and have it drive autonomously and kill people? That could be used as a weapon. So we need to ensure cybersecurity as well. A few weeks ago, a South African surgeon in the University of Pretoria performed the first implant of a 3D printed ear bone. Let me repeat, 3D printed ear bone implanted into the ear and the patient has been recovering since then. It's quite a revolution. Can you see actually uh, the possibility that one day an algorithm will make a mistake? Of course, because they learn from real data. They learn from data and a world that we have actually created. So it, it's probably an imperfect world. Can we one day sue an algorithm for malpractice in medicine? How does that work? Who is owning, you know, who is the owner? Who has the accountability? Who has the liability? Is that the person that actually the coder that designed the algorithm? Is that the entity that actually sold the algorithm? Is that the operator? Is that the, who is actually the user of the algorithm? Who is actually accountable in those situations? In the future, um, and that's what I mentioned in an earlier video, HCP uh, you know, may be more and more reluctant to perform medical actions without an AI assistance or a full AI over, you know, oversight or, or action because they know that more and more AI are going to outperform humans slowly over a given period of time. It's mechanical. Uh, you know, the machine you know, can think faster than we can. We talked about exponential computing. They can memorize large quantity of data, uh, etc. So the doctor will have a huge value in the continuum, but it might be in slightly different area than they are today, where they can show compassion, they can assist the patient, and they can work well in this human-machine collaboration continuum. 
Um, nevertheless, they are now getting a little worried of performing diagnostics, uh, prescription, prognostic, and potentially surgery that could lead to actually being sued uh, you know, if uh, you know, the algorithm uh, it, it has have not been assisting them. Uh, cosmetic use of genetic engineering. I mean, people are now starting to explore area where you can change your hair color or your eye color thanks to you know, skin complexion through genetic modification. What about the ethical implication? We also don't know the medical implication of those. And then, of course, general genetic engineering is, 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 is a big challenge that we just talked about. Let's explore a couple other areas around innovation. How do you think you know, we should regulate a self-improving algorithm? So let me just frame, frame it. We talked in a previous video about the fact that with machine learning, algorithms are constantly improving and learning, right? So you're going to go to an you know, authorized body, let's say EMA or FDA, you're going to get the algorithm approved. Uh, but then the algorithm is going to be evolving over time, learning from data. So the algorithm at a point A is going to, the approval point A is going to be different that, you know, in point B, after maybe, let's say, one or two years of practice, the algorithm will have learned and it's probably slightly different, which is normal. We do that for drugs as well. We monitor safety events, you know, adverse events. You know, we do post-marketing monitoring and a large number of activity. We may need to think about how we apply those, technology, you know, those you know, frameworks in a simple way to those new digital solutions. Should we treat an algorithm like a prescription drug? Is it the same pathway or is it a digital health pathway? You know, we really should start looking at what are the best way to treat those algorithms and, and how they apply. An interesting one in the field of social media is Microsoft uh, created an AI bot, which objective was to exchange with people on Twitter. And the name was Tay. And Tay was very nice and sweet at the beginning for a few days. Hey, nice to meet you. Great to hear about your passion, etc. But Tay was learning from social media data. So people exchanging on social media. And you know, we're humans, so you know, racism, and many other nasty things are happening on social media, uh, you know, problem against diversity, uh, uh, homophobia, etc. And so what happened is gradually the algorithm start learning from a data set that represents human behaviors. And that data set, you know, was containing some of those poor behaviors. So within a matter of days, the algorithm starting to become racist. Uh, you know, and you know, selecting certain genders versus others and making nasty comments. So Microsoft has to take it, uh, had to take it out uh, offline uh, because it was actually learning from a data set that was inherently human, which is unfortunate. How do we do this? How do we manage those implications? Amazon, for example, with the HR department about a few weeks ago, was actually had to stop a, an algorithm uh, which they used to optimize the HR process. And I think that was well intended. Uh, the objective was to select the best candidate and you know you don't know, you have limited resource the problem is the algorithm although well designed was using data from a given department in amazon and in this area it was mostly white caucasian male so there was for 80 percent i think 70 or 80 percent uh, and so what happened is it was inherently biased because that's the nature of the department so the algorithm started to reject female cvs in, in a higher number than the male cvs because it was not one of the criteria, the feature that was elicited by the algorithm in the analysis of the CV. So they had to take it offline as well because it was creating a gender bias. In Saudi Arabia last year, a robot was become for the first time a citizen. Oh yes, yeah, Sophia has a Saudi Arabian passport. Now that's creating challenges. I mean, she has a passport, can she travel? Does she have robo rights? Uh, what do we mean by robo rights anyway? Uh, have we really defined this? I think it's very interesting, fun, but I don't think that you know, prior to doing this, we have realized and we may, you know, the ethical implication and we may starting to set precedents without having really sat down and thought about those implications. The uh, complicated truth about China's social uh, rating or credit system that you may have heard about, where they're collating large amount of data on citizens and then creating a, a rating systems. What are the ethical implications of that? There are you know, pros, you can imagine, you know, driving good behaviors from a societal perspective. But there may be some issue from a you know, democracy or privacy perspective. Imagine the implication of facial recognition and system systemic data collection on citizens, patients, and many other individuals. Uh, you know, and that could deprive them from fundamental rights. We need to make sure that uh, you know, uh, we also carefully understand the implication of virtual reality and augmented reality. We're only starting to see for the last 10 years, especially through video games and other solutions, full immersion of especially young uh, individuals and, and teenage, but also more and more the 30s and the 40s are actively playing, leveraging those technology. We're starting to see impact of virtual reality, augmented reality, and, and those video games on the brain and the functioning of the brain. Without you realizing, utilizing your phone every day, um, you're, you're probably, you know, 
delegating a lot of your memory to Google and oh yeah, I'll Google that, I'll Google this. So you don't have to make effort to train your brain. So a part of the brain actually in charge of memory is probably, you know, uh, you know suffering from a small atrophy because you're not training, it's like a muscle, right? Uh, so you're probably training some new part of the brain. So it's likely that we are in the midst of a, somehow a brain evolution uh, where we haven't fully mapped all the consequences of those technologies. And then, um, you know, when we think about uh, ethical dilemma, we talked about self-driving vehicle, we realize, for example, machine vision algorithm have, have an inherent bias. They are better at spotting light tone type of image versus dark tone of image. So that creates a consequence that if, you know, let's say, uh, you know, a person with a black skin is crossing the street, he or she is more likely to get run over by a, 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 an autonomous vehicle because of the inherent bias in, in the algorithm. So I'd like to conclude this section to ensure that uh, you know, we all think from an ethical perspective on how to embed ethics, compliance, and risk management at the heart of everything we do around technology. Let's make sure that we understand all those technology to a sufficient level of depth so that we can understand the risk. And the spectrum of risk is actually evolving from a traditional you know, spectrum of risk, let's say, um, risk of off-label promotion, anti-bribery and corruption, transparency, into new areas. Think now about algorithmic bias uh, on data sets, on humans. We talked about those algorithmic bias. Uh, and, and those algorithms are making decisions that could impact our lives, or lives of, or, or, or of patients across the world. Think about privacy. Uh, you know, and privacy is a very interesting theme where, you know, to be honest, I'm not sure we, we can have an expectation for privacy, but I'm not sure we have a lot of privacy really with all the data being collected on us. But there are areas we really want to protect, especially in the biopharmaceutical industry, where we're being entrusted with, you know, sensitive health information from patients. We want to utilize this in a way that protect their privacy and maximize the healthcare outcome. Cybersecurity, a lot of those systems we describe in those frontier technology apply to healthcare are connected together to the internet uh, and, and many other different systems. So that makes them more prone to cyber attacks. Safety, both physical and emotional. Thinking about you know, a, say, a robot starting you know, killing people or injuring people, or you know, some of the algorithm uh, that we interact with on a daily basis starting to having you know, negative impact on the brain uh, or on our emotional situation. Uh, beneficence and human well-being, not only we want to make sure they're actually not injuring us, but they're also fostering uh, you know, our well-being. And that, that's what we call a perception of beneficence of AI. We want to make sure they're not only here to reduce the occurrence of harmful uh, utilization, but also of beneficial utilization. What about explainability of result? One of the challenges we talked about in a previous video on artificial intelligence and deep learning in particular is that you know, the, if you remember in, in the neural networks, you have the input layer, the output layer, and then a lot of information being processed in the intermediary layers. We don't sometimes really know what's happening. We had situation where you know, last year uh, at Google, they were doing a test with two algorithms negotiating, I think it was Apple and pears. Uh, and you know, one was starting to get, trying to get more Apple and the other one more pears. And before they realized, the two algorithms were talking together in a language that the programmer could not understand. It become apple, apple, pear, 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 apple, pear, and then before they realize, they just had to plug, to unplug the algorithm because it could actually bear some risk that it, it could just go out of control. Um, so there are a, lo a lot of issues around what we call explainability or the black box concept, where we need to make sure that AI not only is producing analytical work for us, but is also explaining to us how it came to that conclusion. And that's very important because it will help us better trust the system you know, and, and the trust is essential, especially in our industry, so we can deliver digital health solution that can be trusted by patients thanks to the explainability. And of course, transparency of decision. Once we understand those decisions, we need to communicate them in a transparent way. If you're interested in learning more about those technologies and their application, please check out my other videos on the topic. Thank you very much.